Happy holidays, everyone. Here we are on a sunny Woodstock day above freezing with a little snow on the ground coming up on the solstice, which is the reason of the celebration. In ancient humanity of what is afraid, and even all of us subconsciously are afraid, as the days get shorter and shorter and the darkness increases, that we will, the sun will disappear and we'll live only in the darkness. So when the situation turns around at the solstice in the northern hemisphere, then we feel very much relieved. And there is a ceremony that everyone does, burning the Yule log, an ancient pagan ceremony. Indigenous people have their own version. The Happy Holidays includes Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Happy Gandan Ngamche Day for the Tibetans, Happy Solstice Renewal Day. I, I heard that Fox News, they're going just happy, happy Merry Christmas, they're like saying. That's the only American thing to do, but that's a fake thing. That's really not good. It's uh, holidays are holidays. And every different kind of person with a different kind of worldview has their own kind. And we should respect all of them equally. So it's very good to say Happy Holidays rather than only Merry Christmas or only Happy Hanukkah or only God, Happy Ganding Gamcha, like forget about your holidays sort of thing to people. Okay? So that's why I'm saying Happy Holidays. And you know, one thing, what is a holiday? Why do we love them? Why do we get to, you know, treat them as something special? Because uh, that's when we remember sort of the larger picture, where we are. We kind of relax our immediate worries and we stop worrying about getting this or that thing done, ideally, <laughs> if we've done, got most of the things already done. And we sit back and sort of relax into reality. And actually all the spiritual traditions have one version or another at their mystical heart. <clears throat> Some more mystical, mystical means only hidden, you know. Some more mystical than others, depending on the society and the era. They have at their mystical heart the idea that everything is fine. That Nirvana is here already. That this is God, you know. So of course, there are some exoteric, very dreadful doctrines about hell, about the radical otherness of God, like the horror of samsara and Nirvana is off somewhere else. These are this kind of thing which are calculated to try to get people to aspire to improve their own situation and not be too complacent in their own situation. So as to get them to work hard at something or other. That's, how they, well, that's in all of the traditions. All of them have that. But on holidays, they sort of celebrate the inner mystical thing, whether consciously or not. That's why they're holy days. Because you touch on what is holy. And what is holy is life itself. And the actuality of life itself is the clear light of the void, as we Buddhists would say. As the materialists would say, the zero quantum point, uh, like infinite energy field, the vacuum energy field. The uh, non-dual Christian mystics and Kabbalistic mystics and Sufi mystics and Vaishnavite mystics and Shaivite mystics to list the five major theistic, uh, you know, monotheistic kind of traditions. They celebrate being one with God. Not the otherness of God, like God somewhere else, and they're like just a piece of whatever. The oneness of God, that they are totally, they annihilate their egocentric perspective and their separate point of view in experientially and trust that also and feel that oneness with the divine, you know. And uh, Buddhists are also do that. That's what Nirvana is. Nirvana is Buddha's heart. Buddha's reality body. It is uh, clear, as I said, clear light of the void. 
which means which is only known as bliss. Only can he experience it through pure bliss of giving everything and unifying with everyone. So that should be no mystery. So therefore you have a happy holiday by remembering that. And of course the ideal thing is to carry over from the holiday into your non-holiday life a sense of the wonderful holiday because after all being a human being is a holiday from being a subsistence level animal, which we've all been, where you're the lioness out there running to get an antelope to eat it up, bring it back to your kittens or your cubs, and, the, and your irritating husband who lies around lazily <coughs> waiting for fertilization season, and doesn't hunt, bother to hunt with you usually, although it maybe can function in defense. And that's like endless, there's no holidays on that one. Temporary full belly, that's all, but no holidays. So being a human itself is a holiday and having the cleverness to figure things out in such a way so as to be able to arrange things, to sink into reality, to melt into reality, to embrace reality, to feel love that is not demanding any kind of anything out of the beloved, it just loves it. And by through just loving, it just gives up being apart from it. Not depending on any kind of reaction of the beloved. That's a wonderful human thing. And we all have that. So we, that's a, we have a, like a lifelong holiday, actually. We do. And death is no interruption, really. It's a quantum leap from one form of life to another, that's all. Like it's a, like when you, if you walk through a door from one room to another, nothing is really interrupted, as long as the next room is a nice room. And if you've been really nice, and if you, if you have made the room you are leaving really nice, then it's likely you'll find a really nice other room, because you will have an idea of what is really nice. So, that's my encouragement about the holiday, in particular Christmas. To look at that, Christmas is a time that celebrates the birth of Jesus, who was a nice Jewish boy, son of a carpenter, although it became, became revealed by his, his prophet, John the Baptist, and later by his own deeds and his own teachings and his own realization and experience that he actually was lived as one with God. In one way they say son of God, but they li he lived as if he was God on earth because he felt that way. He didn't really feel like separate from God, except he showed that feeling here and there to people to make him them feel that he was one of them. So, which in a way is like a teaching that they are one with God. Actually, the Reverend Moon, whoever knows what has happened to him, <laughs> I don't. He really made the conventional Christian theologians angry by insisting that everyone is a son and daughter of God. And so, and that what Jesus was trying to teach was that we should all live like we were one with God. And I don't know, this is, uh, certainly his political views did not necessarily reflect that. I think he didn't like communist unbelievers and uh, he uh, but he but he was kind of clever I love the favorite joke that he taught when he was on the Jack Parr show which I never saw but I heard about it where Jack Parr he was telling Jack Parr how Jesus had appeared to him on the docks at Inchon and had told him a lot of things about his mission and therefore he was he was he had a mission from Jesus from the Christ so there there was a, speaking about the idea of, of being on holiday all the time and not and slowly but gradually and and experientially working not to feel separate from the universe to feel one with the basic goodness of life and the oneness with the universe that's how that is why we enjoy holidays and we should have that enjoyment during regular days. In a way, make them all holidays. 
even though we might work, but we might, therefore, we would do work which we feel is valuable. We don't just do work to get money or as someone's slave. And, of course, if we are someone's slave, as unfortunately there is slavery on this planet, great, huge millions of people still, especially women, but more children too, in some places where they have bad employers, you know. So, in the, in the light of talking about being one with the divine, which is what I want to say is the essence of the, holi of the, of the holiday, and which is the mystic core of all spiritual traditions, even though some of them, when they get in their exoteric core or their public core, in some more authoritarian societies, religions gets used to make people feel more and more separate and therefore more and more subject to some authorities, either high priests or kings, you know, or ministers or whatever, or governments, you know, the state, you know. So, that holiday is where you can feel a little connected to the divine, which makes you a little more free, right? So my point is, I like very much a joke that, and then I was talking about uh, Reverend Moon. Uh, may he rest in peace, I guess, probably by now. I really don't know. Uh, that uh, he, his doctrine that everyone is the son of God. So every or daughter of God, everyone is 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 so Jesus wanted to, in other words, he interpreted Jesus' teaching as being that you know we all should feel connected to the divine. And I guess his popularity a little bit came from there, as well as maybe the militant organizational structure. But uh and then he's disappeared and all the buildings he bought and everything, universe, campuses, and they're all gone. I have no idea what happened to him. But he, but, but I like that idea that everyone is one with the divine. That is really where, now we're in a time in history when the mystical should no longer be mystical, meaning hidden, which is what it really means. It doesn't mean irrational, it just means hidden. And uh, the mystical should be the everyday, because we all need to feel one with the divine, and there, thereby one with each other. So there are all these religious differences, political differences, status differences, economic differences, national differences, racial differences, gender differences, etc., will be not, will be less like uh, onerous, you know, and less absolute. Of course, there'll still be differences. And we, you know, within the oneness, there are differences. That's part of the joy of being one. But the differences are not absolute, they're only relative. And therefore, you're more people become more tolerant and more happy with diversity and more feeling enriched by it rather than threatened by it, and so on and so on, and less 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 uh, intensely and fanatically clinging to their own difference, you know, this kind of thing. So anyway, in that light, I just thought Reverend Moon, because everyone was jumps when they hear Reverend Moon, they hate him. But I have to say, I like this one thing, where he was on the Jack Parr show. And uh, he was talking about how Jesus was instructing him in his mystic visions while he was working on the docks at Incheon in all kinds of new theology, which became the theology of his church, Unification Church. And then Jack Parr, who of course was very skeptical of all this, he asked him, he said, well, Reverend Moon, that's very nice, but what language did Jesus talk to you in? So Reverend Moon said, why Korean, of course, because he only speaks Korean. Or spoke Korean, and Jack Parr looked very, very skeptical at that. So then, and then, and which Reverend Moon noticed. So then, through his translator, because he was not speaking English, right? So through his translator, he said, with a heavy Jewish accent, of course, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is very entertaining to the idea of thinking of Korean with a Jewish accent. You know, Kamsahamda. How would you say Kamsahamda? With the Jewish accent, Kamsahamda or something. It's like really Kamsahamda is the only Korean I remember, which is means thank you. You know. And uh anyway, I think it's very funny. So I know it's irrelevant because this is happy holidays, but I want you to have a chuckle. Maybe you'll get a chuckle out of that. And um, you know, I'm not promoting the Reverend Moon's cult, don't worry. I'm not into any cult, you know, I don't really like them. And, um, you know, in the sense of they've become things where people can't think for themselves, you know, they follow authority. That's, I think that's 
that's really bad on the planet today because unfortunately more people are happy on the planet today actually than they had been in the past i believe that i think stephen pinker's little better angels of our nature book has a point although i don't quite agree with all of his statistics but i think there is a point that you know we are happier on this planet there's lots more of us we this is what we've been a little bit too harsh with the other animals and with nature, of course, and then we're going to destroy ourselves if we keep it up. But most people are more happy. Now, the ones who are unhappy, they want to be big authorities and they want to boss other people around because they wrongly think that they're going to be happy when they're big bosses or when they're billionaires or when they're presidents or generals or dictators or oligarchs. They think they're going to be more happy and actually they become less happy and more paranoid and freaked out and more cruel and weird unfortunately, but because more people are happy, somehow they manage to rise to the top. And that's what's wrong with the planet right now, as we are very strongly seeing in the United States of North America, as the Mexicans call us. We are, have, we're ended up with the worst kind of authoritarian government we've ever had by far, who are even using their authority to try to destroy the government. How about that? and become just, you know, uncontrolled oligarchs with no government to protect the people against the wealthy, you know, the oligarchs, the corporations. We're in that phase. And we've gotten ourselves there because we're more happy. We're more jolly. See, this is the good side to it. I know everyone thinks it's terrible and it's doomsday and we're all finished, but we're not. We're more happy, but then we're more susceptible to being, we're more vulnerable to being bossed around by unhappy people who become cruel and unthinking like the current Republican tax bill, wrecking everyone's lives, you know, and deceiving and lying to the ones who think they support it because they're stuck in the personality and they're lied to and told this will help them when actually it's taking away their health care, taking away their wealth, what little bit of wealth they have left. It's really so terrible. But never mind, we are still more happy, so we will prevail, you know. As Jesus did say, once he grew up, after little baby Jesus was born, which happens on Christmas, he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. We who are being pushed around by the bosses and authorities are the meek, and we will inherit, not because of communism, not because of socialism, anymore. although socialism, actually everybody has socialism and that's good. That just means you worry about the whole society. It's all it means. It doesn't mean anything. It's nothing to do with communism. The dictatorship of the proletariat is very unsocialistic, actually. As you're seeing, look how easy in China it switched to dictatorial capitalism, state capitalism. And in and Russia, oligarchic capital and not even decent capitalism just they became a resource providing oil nation, basically, controlled by KGB. So it's really terrible. We don't want to do it like that, even though we have a KGB agent as president now. Never mind. That's an absolute fact. If you want to be stupid and not look at the facts, then you don't, okay? You think it's, that's not the case, but that is the case. And pretending to be a little rough on Russia right now to try to get out of being caught and doing their agenda and wrecking our country. But we're still happy. And actually, Russian people are quite happy. Nazdorovya, if any of you are Russian. They're very happy people. They're great people. They have a wonderful language and culture and um, wonderful onion domes. And, you know, their, their White House is a multicolored house, like a stack of candy canes. <laughs> it looks like Santa brought the Kremlin, like right down the chimney. It's an awesome thing, but it's been occupied by cruel people, unfortunately, a little bit lately. Although they like to have fun too. If they would just switch to having fun, they'd be probably off in France somewhere with their ill-gotten gains, and then the rest of the money could research, start circulating amongst the people in Russia, and they would be with a little sort of modern, you know, Scandinavian-style northern capitalism, you know, socialistic capitalism, and they'll be happy, you know. But they are happy. That's the thing.
Everyone is more happy. You have to remember that on Christmas. That's the key thing. And be more happy yourself. Don't watch news either right or left too much. You know, pick one show you watch for one hour to get the news. PBS is the best. Please don't watch those like Alex Jones and the completely insane people and turn off Limbaugh. These people who want to make you more angry. Why would you? Anger hurts your body. Anger hurts your circulatory system. Anger like hurts your friends and neighbors, you know, and it makes you miserable, completely miserable. You know, you, if it makes you do something harmful to someone, you feel then more miserable afterwards. And if it, you, you don't do anything harmful, you just see the anger, then that just makes you feel awful. You know, it comes from a, an old Germanic Anglo-Saxon word, anger, which means to feel pain, you know, anger. So it's reacting to injury in an angry way. It's a kind of a reaction to feeling pain, and it makes you feel pain, actually. It is painful to be angry. So why would you pay someone, give them eyeballs, give them ear balls, ear, <laughs> ear, ear lobes, whatever you do, to make you angry, which is just to hurt you? Why would you do that? You really should stop swimming in the sea of, you know, whipped up frenzy, which people are using to exploit you, don't you realize that? And anybody on the left who's whipping up frenzy, forget about it, don't bother with it, you know. But information that is valid information, you check, you look up, you cross-check. Be a little bit of a detective yourself. Find out the facts, not the fake facts, but the real ones, not the alternative facts, the actual facts. Look up all the fact checkers, you know, the nonpartisan people who are just seeking reality. Look, look to the scientists and then, then follow the facts, you know, and then you realize how misled you've been if you've been watching those anger programs. And if you're on the left, realize that you've been made feel impotent and frustrated by the extremists on the left. They're the ones who say everyone is bad. There's no one good. We're an evil empire. Everybody's an evil empire. It's all hopeless. You know. Don't listen to them either. They paralyze you from doing anything creative and constructive. And the where when you're powerful, when you can do something creative and constructive, is when you're happy. You know, like sometimes you feel you lay, you go to the Caribbean, let's say, have a little sunshine. Maybe have a different kind of vacation and help them in Puerto Rico rebuilding something or clearing some garbage or something to do a little work, a couple hours a day, go down as a volunteer and take some time off, have some sunshine. Then you feel good and strong and you feel nourished. You have your vitamin D going, you have a little sea, bathe in the sea. Then you feel like you could deal with whatever it is at home. Well, you should be like that all the time at home. Maybe you can't hear the usual frenzy programs, you know. So don't go for frenzy. Go for peace. Let's meditate. Let's meditate right now. Just close your eyes and just lean comfortably back or stand back or lie back. And just realize that, you know, you have a body that's mostly comfortable. Maybe if you're elderly like me. You have a little pain here and there. But in a way, maybe you're mostly comfortable. Maybe if you're having a really hard time financially, you're a little hungry. But you know, you can think, you know, fasting, the body does well when you fast. And don't put in junk food. And you know, don't lose too much weight. Go find a soup kitchen that has more healthy food, organic food. Don't eat the poison junk food, please. It's really bad for you. Better not to eat anything. But go get some banana. Eat a lot of bananas. They're not too expensive. And just find out what feels good. Try to count your blessings. And if you can't find anything good in your whole self and environment, then maybe you're not looking hard enough. Or you're really in a bad situation. In which case, Joyfully resist the situation. Joyfully seek help to ameliorate the situation. 
other human, if you approach anybody joyfully, happily, they will try to help you because human beings do like to help each other. They might run away too, some of them being afraid that they'll have to do so too much for too many. Some get like that, but, but they'll probably help. You know, and, uh, you know, Jesus loves you anyway. Buddha loves you. God loves you. Krishna, Vishnu, Shiva, they all love you. Allah loves you. The Dalai Lama loves you. You know, the angels, there are lots of angels, they love you. Moses loves you. Rabbi Hillel loves you. All the great, like, Kabbalists and Hasidics, they love you. They do. The Mormons love you. They run around and look at, the, at, at death records and obituaries and they baptize you in the bardo. <laughs> Try to help you to go to heaven. They really love you. And they sing their wonderful choirs. I love you. I do. That just means, it doesn't mean I'm going to gar goggle at you or do anything. It just means that I want you to be happy. That's what love means. Love doesn't want to possess a beloved. Love doesn't want anything from the beloved. Love wants the beloved to be happy. That's the definition. And it goes with compassion, which is not wanting the beloved to suffer or not wanting anyone to suffer. And that's what the divine energy of the universe is. And that's what you celebrate on Christmas, where by seeing it as a story of a family and of a God of a particular nation, which is what happened, the Jewish nation, Jesus was Jewish. Any Christians who don't, you know, who feel a little nervous with their brethren, their Jewish brethren, Jesus was Jewish. He's teaching you something. If he's God's son, he could be born in any form. You know, he could be born as Turkish. He could be born as Arab. He was born as Jewish. He wasn't born as Indian. He wasn't born as Chinese. He was born as Jewish. It doesn't mean that other sons of God, without announcing themselves as the only son of God, was not born for all the other different kinds of people on the entire planet and in all the many planets in the universe. It's ridiculous to this thing, the one, only one here and there by an omnipotent, omnicompetent, omni-loving being. There's no shortage of, of incarnations and emanations to the benefit beings and help free them from suffering. That's what the divine energy does. But Jesus is a beautiful form of that. And be, he was born in a manger amongst the animals, you know. And, you know, the nasty people were afraid of him because they're afraid of their people being happy. Because happy people don't want to be pushed and bossed around and exploited and enslaved. They realize there's no need for that. We can all be cooperative and work together. You know, I want to say something. Haiti, we should all love Haiti. They suffer so much. And they have suffered so much all along. They were once a thriving Native American island. Columbus and his brother landed there, and they killed them all in 15 years. And then they had no more slaves they, in the most vicious manner. Really, they were so... And they, because they were so unhappy because they were in a culture that had been fighting, having Christian, Muslim, Jewish wars all the time. 1492 is the year that Fernando and Isabella kicked all the Jews out of, out of uh, Spain and Portugal or tortured them or, or converted them by force. And a lot of them went, by the way, interesting piece of history for those who are nervous about Muslims, those Jews who are nervous about Muslims, they were embraced by the Ottoman Empire, who, who took them to Sarajevo and to Istanbul and to wherever and had them, had them use their extraordinary talents to improve the country. And uh, Sarajevo was a big center. And then they had to flee and they went to North Africa and stuff. And the Muslim people were fine with them. Muslims and Jews are very, very similar. They're Abrahamic from different children, Ishmael and Isaac, you know. And um, 
shouldn't be having, there's no religious problem, really. There's political one. Yeah. By some unhappy, bossy, authoritarian, cruel leaderships on both sides. But there is no uh, problem, really, among the happy people on both sides. No problem. It can be solved in five minutes, whatever it is, by the moms all getting together and and making and the and the and the dads being more happy and less pushy. Okay. Anyway, that's what I have to say about Christmas. Not quite. Not quite. I do, I do love baby Jesus. We all do love the idea of of a of love coming in the form of a baby. And there's a beautiful Krishna story I want to tell about Krishna. Krishna has a very parallel story. In a way, Buddha does too. Buddha was born in a garden, not a manger. He was a prince and a king, not a carpenter's son. He was a North Indian particular nation called the Shakyas. He was not Jewish. But otherwise, very similar. You know, he he was born outside the, the father's palace. and uh, But he wasn't persecuted at all by the father. That was different. And um, but there were a bunch of bad people around, you know, who during Buddha's life they did attack his country and things happened, but he somehow survived all of that. And then baby Krishna, however, is very Jesus-like story. He's Vishnu. He is an incarnation they call it rather than Sana, but it's the incarnation of Vishnu, and who, who is the the all powerful monotheistic deity of the Vaishnavites. In India, and uh, there was a king who heard, who had a prophecy, a soothsayer saying someone who would overthrow his cruel kingdom was being born. So he went around having all the male children in that time frame killed. So Krishna's parents had to send him off to a cow herding family in, in another state um, outside of the power of that king, and he was brought up by a foster mother. But he had amazing things happen during his childhood. And then he also loved yogurt. And he used to go and steal yogurt. If there was a pot of yogurt, he would go consume it. So at one point, then his foster mom had a big jug of yogurt, like bigger than a baby. And he was only barely crawling around Krishna. And so she then tied Krishna up like on a leash. She had to go somewhere for an errand. And she tied him up on the wagon wheel far away from that pot of yogurt, like a big pot of yogurt. And then when she came back, to her amazement, he had somehow gotten out of his leash, and he had consumed the whole pot of yogurt, which was bigger than his own body. So she was really freaked out. Like, Not that she was a little annoyed that the yogurt had been overeaten, but she was also like, How, what happened to it? Where did you put it, you know? So she opened his mouth, and little, he was happy, googling there, and she looked inside, and when she looked in, she saw the whole vast star, all the stars and the cosmos and other galaxies, and like, a, like an infinite vision in his mouth. Of course, because he was God, you see. He was son of God, the incarnation of God. And they have beautiful stories like that. So they, they play with the baby story also. And then Jesus grows up, and then he too tells us to be happy. And he a little bit warns the rich, the over-rich, you know, about getting to heaven, that they're not going to get to heaven unless a certain, it will take a camel going through the eye of a needle. Although he, he can do miracles, so it's not impossible. But at, at first it seems impossible, camel going through the eye of a needle. But what he means by that is that if you're too much involved in your possessions and you're too much in worried about others taking them away and all this kind of thing, that if you're like only focused on your own wealth, being selfish, you'll never be happy. If you love God with your heart and soul, forget about yourself, love your neighbor as yourself, then you will be happy. Is what he means. And you could do that as a wealthy person by being more generous, of course. He's not excluding that. There's the miracle of generosity, which we celebrate at Christmas, at the solstice time, at the holiday, by giving gifts to each other, which is really wonderful. Although it's annoying having to go around shopping, figuring out what people want. But then you think about people and what they need and what they like. You try to give it some thought. It isn't just how much it costs what you give them. 
it's what you think would be great for them. And that makes you happy to do it. It's kind of fun. You drop out from your workaholism, and here I'm telling myself, pot calling the kettle black, that's me about workaholism. Okay? Anyway, that's my podcast, my Christmas podcast. Oh, no, not quite. I wanted to read. I want to do this Christmas. I want us to pray for the incarnation of the universal compassion of all Buddha. It's one of them. There's several of them. Lots of them. But one of them, namely His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I want to pray for his long life as a Christmas present to myself and to all of you. And anybody who wants to think through it as I read a few verses, please do. It says, Om Swasti. Swasti means all is well. And those on the left who are feeling oppressed by the Republican tax bill, be happy. It won't last forever. We're going to get back the House and the Senate and we'll undo it and, and give the money back to the to the more humble people. And the, now the extra money they don't need will take back from the rich people. Don't worry. You know, we're not taking everything. We love it that there's some rich people. That's great to be rich because it enables you to be generous. The real value of wealth is the giving it. As all those families who made great foundations and Bill Gates now even alive has discovered that's the real joy. That's the real benefit of it. It isn't holding on and clutching and trying to get more. It's giving it. That's the joy of it. Warren Buffett knows that. Om Swasti. The vast love and primordial wisdom of the Buddhas all are embodied in the God who loves all beings. Lokeshvara, white like a dazzling snow mountain. Sublime and holy. He's really white, not like the, what we call the white race who are all pink, by the way. Like those deities are really genuinely white, like crystal. Sublime and holy Lord of the world, you who are his emanation, a guru for each and every being in the three realms, may you be victorious. Wondrous and without equal in the three realms, Omniscient and as unique as the Udumbara flower, an extraordinary flower. Great crown jewel for the teachings and all beings on earth. Supreme victorious one, holder of the lotus. I pray for your long life. He holds the lotus of wisdom. The lotus of everything is all right, of Swasti, the Swasti lotus. Always and forever enlightened, yet in this age of conflict, you gather living beings together within your embrace, your resolve and your commitment unshakable like a Vajra, which means a diamond energy, infinite energy of the void, clear light of the void. Great Lord on the tenth stage, that's like a Bodhis Buddha Bodhisattva, same, you know, like a Buddha angel. If a Buddha is almost similar to like a divine, almost beyond anything you can imagine, an angel at least mediates and comes and helps the beings. I pray for your long life. All the realizations of the stages of the path to enlightenment are merged as one in your secret body, speech, and mind. Your qualities of knowledge and love, inconceivable. Second Buddha of the north of the, of the snowy land of Tibet, I pray for your long life. And many things, there's too many to write, but it, I praise you. You are Manjushri, you know the god of wisdom, the lion of speech. You are Vajradhara, the omnipresent lord of bliss. You are Milarepa, the great yogi who, who lived naked on top of the snowy mountain at 25,000 feet because of the inner heat of his inner love inside his own body. You are Vajrapani, the lord of secrets, and the one who changes evil to good. You are Nagarjuna, the lord of the dragons, uh, the water serpents, you know, the water beings who bring fertility and love to the earth and who understand the central way beyond absoluteness and nothingness. You are Pundarika, especially Pundarika, the white lotus King of Shambhala, who wrote a marvelous clear light, stainless light commentary on the time machine, your highest and most superior historical teaching. 
You are Samantha Bhadra, the holy good one who is everywhere in every atom trying to help people. And you are in this life Lord Tenzin Gyatso, the great ocean who upholds the teaching. Uh, the the real, really yeah, life after life, you know. I pray for your long life. A hundred times with reverence and awe, the jeweled heads of the mighty ones of the three worlds, by that, that they, by that they mean many angels and gods and titans and not only political leaders, you know. Bow to the auspicious wheels of your lotus feet, great sovereign of Dharma, I pray for your long life. And the Lord of the gods, annihilating the demonic forces of the titans, with the hundred-pointed Vajra of power, energy, and strength, destroying the rocky mountains of wrong and misleading views, fearsome Sri Heruka, like Hercules, you know, Hercules of philosophy, I pray for your long life. Destroying unhappiness is what your job is as a loving being. As long as this earth, Mount Meru, sun and moon endure, may you remain secure, invincible on your Vajra diamond throne, in the celestial mansion of Potala, the safe harbor for all beings, Avalokiteshvara's delight, your secret body, speech, and mind forever changeless. Through the grace of the three supreme deities of long life, Amitabha, Amitayas, uh, Ushnesha Vijaya, and White Tara, and the power of the truth of these are angels, you know, Buddhas and angels, by the power of the truth of teachers, Yidams, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, may all that we have prayed for be blessed and magically transformed and achieved and be accomplished without any obstacle. I just wanted to read that for the holiday. How wonderful is this, Holy the Dalai Lama, how we must pray that the leaders and the people of China get to meet him as we all have and feel delighted by his presence and feel that Guan Yin has returned to them and they can relax and they can enjoy and no, suffer no more humiliation and inflict no humiliation on anybody else. May that day soon come. You know, really, soon, soon, soon. And it isn't that he's dominating them all, it's that he inspires them. Even the king, even the dictator can be happy. Instead of worrying about paranoia and power, you know. Even the oligarch can be happy. Instead of worrying about how to prevent other people from taking away their oligarch power. Even the malignant narcissist is curable at any age, although difficult when fortified inside their social structure, but still curable. If they really sought true happiness, they could be, it could be found for them. Even they'd done bad things. Even murderer can be rehabilitated. It, it's possible. And uh, although we should defend, and if he's, any of the murderers actually functionally trying to kill somebody, we should defend against that, of course. But they can be rehabilitated. It's just they become so crazed. So, love is all it is. Give everyone Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club ban for Christmas or for Hanukkah or for whatever they celebrate, okay? All the best. Bye. I, am, I don't like to promote myself, but I'm just a co-author and really I'm promoting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama's illustrated biography is a great gift for young or old. Of course, it is a gigantic comic book, so the young will like it. And it also has tremendous information and gives the whole view of the 80 years, the uh, first 81 years of His Holiness's life. He's now 83. So there are two years we've left out. <laughs> but we, in a way, we have put the future in by showing his vision of how he expects the world to work and what will soon happen, which is very, very positive. So it's very encouraging. And there's a little horror stuff in there because there's a bad guy, you know, and there's like some bad stuff that happens and, and showing his holiness, his greatness, responding to injury on himself and his people 
with love and nonviolence, not, uh, not and resistance and joyful resistance in the sense of using the weapon of truth, telling his story, telling the short story of the people, but not, not wishing violence upon the violator, wishing to dialogue with them, find what's wrong with them, why did they bother with that? Is there another way they can realize the happiness that they think they got by violating Tibet and its people and himself? And he will show that, and he, that will happen, and that, that, that great reconciliation will happen. And not only that, but the great reconciliation between the pink people, who think they're white, and the yellow people, and the black people, and the red people, all the different races on earth, but the big crisis at the moment will soon be between the pink people and the yellow people with the powerful emergence of China as one of the great powers on earth. No longer doing your laundry or just running your restaurant, but actually being, being an equal with you. And doing some laundry and restaurants as you, we are doing laundry and restaurants. Like everyone gets to do a little of everything. Type of world that we're going to have. So he can be a great, great mediator in any potential difficulties that will be arising there between. And that, that is so well, such a great gift that will be in addition, of course, to finding his, uh, getting his own people a break and restoring the environment of the water tower of Asia, beautiful, magnificent Tibet, and lighting up the candles of love and joy and bliss once again on the roof of the world, sending the beam, the lighthouse, you know, of the multicolored rainbow beam shining from there so that Santa can fly. I have, I have a honing, homing device for Santa to fly to take all his gifts to the Asian people, whether or not they're Christians, never mind. Okay? All the best. That's my promotion. Bye. Man of Peace.